Good evening, everybody. Welcome to night six of Lambda School's web development mini bootcamp. My name is Deandra Ryan Moss. I am an instructor here at Lambda School, and I'm going to be teaching you live tonight from Bisbee, Arizona. So welcome to night six. Uh, please join me on Slack if you want to be interactive in this lecture. Uh, just to let you guys know, I don't monitor the chat on YouTube, so definitely make sure you're in the Slack channel. So we can communicate, you can tell me when my Wi-Fi is being terrible, and you can ask questions at the end. So for everyone joining us for the first time tonight, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Lambda School and about this mini boot camp. So Lambda School is a six-month computer science immersive, and it's totally online. So it is for six months, from Monday to Friday, full time, you will be learning computer science and web development from us. And we teach you through a combination of live video lectures, Q&As, group work, solo work, homework. So it's a really interactive, dynamic class. And over the course of six months, you will go from being a very beginning web developer to being a full stack developer ready to get a job in the field. Speaking of getting a job, one thing that's really cool about Lambda School is our tuition model. So we do not charge you anything up front. We wait until you have gotten that job, until you have to pay your tuition. So I've mentioned this on pretty much every video, but I want to talk about it in a little more detail tonight, because I think it is one of the things that makes Lambda School really awesome. A lot of us at Lambda School, myself included, went through these web development boot camps ourselves. And I have to tell you from personal experience, it was pretty frightening. You put forward a lot of cash up front, it's not an accredited school and it's kind of like this could be the best choice I ever made or this could be like the worst financial decision of my life. As it were, it worked out pretty well for me and for almost everyone else I know who went through, but it's still kind of scary putting all that money up front, um, not knowing what's going to happen. And in a lot of cases, a lot of people didn't have that money or had to take out loans. So Lambda School wanted to avoid putting that students in that predicament and we also wanted to avoid um, only opening our education to people with means. We wanted to make sure that everyone who wants to learn and can learn is able to. So that's why we have a de-risk model, which means that you pay zero up front, and then only after you get that full-time job working more than 50K, you pay us back over the next two years. So it's a really great way to make sure that you're able to join the school and make sure that we're holding up our end of the bargain and we're getting you that job that you will be ready for by the end. So that's Lambda School for you. Uh, check us out online, or if you're interested in applying, reach out to Karen Zachary on Slack. A little bit about this mini boot camp. If you've been with us so far, hopefully you know what you're in for. If you are joining us for the first time and you're a beginner, this is probably not the best time to jump in because we're in the depths of JavaScript right now. But we do have a new course starting next Monday, so you're welcome to join us from scratch. But Last week, we saw some HTML, CSS, and started on JavaScript. And this week, it's just all JavaScript. So last night, we dove into functions. And tonight, we are going to be learning about two very critical data structures called arrays and objects. So let me go ahead and start talking about arrays and objects so we can get to coding as soon as possible. So there's this concept called data structures in programming. And it's a very broad term that essentially refers to ways that we like to group data. So oftentimes, we'll have variables that relate to each other. For example, if we wanted to get some JavaScript data on everyone in this class, we might want information on your name, your location, whether or not you've applied to Lambda School yet or not. And for each of you, that would be three or more, 10 variables, plus all, these, all of those variables would all sort of relate to each other. And we could just declare 100, 1,000, however many separate variables, but that wouldn't be a very good way of keeping track of things. It wouldn't reflect in the code that these variables are related in some fundamental way. Data structures allows us to group data together in a meaningful way. So let me go ahead and share my screen. We'll hop into REPLit, and then I can show you what I mean in coding form. So let's learn a little bit about data structures. OK, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of an example of what not to do here. So building off of that example I just mentioned, let's say that we wanted to create um, a list of everybody in this class. So we would start with maybe student one, 
and we'll all make up some names. And then maybe we have students two. And student three. So notice that I'm starting to repeat myself in a pretty big way. And I know I've mentioned this a little bit already, and this is that there's a concept that I'm going to keep coming back to again and again, which is this idea of dry coding. Dry stands for don't repeat yourself. So sometimes that means literally writing the same line of code over and over, but often it means writing lines of code that are different but clearly related. There's clearly a pattern here. I'm calling this variable student one, student two, student three, and then following with a name. So when you start to see code that has this pattern and is getting a little repetitive, that's when you might think to yourself, I'm violating this dry principle. So maybe I need to find a better way to write this code. And as well, this is only three students. If I were trying to type out 100 students, this would get extremely repetitive. So this is probably not the best way to keep track of all the students in the class. Furthermore, beyond it just being problematic for me as a programmer because I have to write everything out, it's not very useful as far as the computer is concerned. As a human reader, it's easy for us to see, okay, student one, student two, student three, clearly these variables are related to each other in some way. As a human user, that's pretty obvious. But as far as the computer is concerned, these are all just distinct variables. And as far as we know, they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And that's not good, because when our data is linked in some meaningful way, we want that to be reflected in the structure of the code itself. So this would be a great example of when we want to use an array. So an array is a data type in JavaScript, just like a string or a Boolean or a number. But whereas those uh, data types are referred to as primitive because they're a little more basic, arrays are a little bit more complicated. So let me show you, but not too bad. Let me show you how to declare an array. So if I called it students, let me scoot this over so we can see more code. So here is how you would declare an array the most simple way. And in this case, I've declared an empty array. So there's nothing in it. So I start out with something that looks very familiar. I'm using my const keyword, the name of the array, my single equal sign for assignments, and then I follow it with these two hard brackets. A couple things I want to point out is that just like any other variable, we could use um, we could use const or let here. Generally speaking, we'd probably use const for an array, though, because though we'll be mutating the data inside it as we go, uh, we usually don't want to overwrite an array like that. But yeah, so um, just like any primitive variable, we use this kind of same style of declaring it. One thing I want to point out is that by convention, you use a plural word to name an array. So when I say convention, what I mean is that as far as the computer is concerned, it doesn't care what we call this thing. We could call this thing anything. Um, but fellow programmers are used to seeing plural variables for arrays. So this is a way to cue your fellow programmers and maybe yourself in the future, once you've forgotten what you wrote two weeks ago, uh, that this type of variable is an array. So by convention, plural variable names are usually arrays. So let's look at what I put over here. So arrays are always denoted by these hard brackets. If you want to start with just an empty array like this one, all you have to do is put the brackets. So that's the most simple way to create an array, which is essentially just a list of items. Now, what we, would, what we could also do is go ahead and populate our array. Um, there's ways to populate arrays after you've already declared them, and we'll go over those shortly but you can also put data straight in from the get-go. So I'm gonna go ahead and take these three students and put them in my array. So there we go. I can now get rid of this. Let me move this up here actually as a what not to do example. 
And then down here we see this. So this is much more elegant. Uh, for one, we've saved ourselves quite a bit of time. We don't have to declare a new variable for every single student in the class. And that's really nice. But beyond that, and probably more importantly than saving time, is that we've now grouped these items together. So built in explicitly to the structure of this variable is an idea that these three strings are all related in some way. They're all students in the class. And of course, whereas up here, if we wanted to add more students, we'd have to declare a variable and start a new line every time. Up here, we can just write it directly into the array. So there you go. We now have four students in our students array. So the next thing I want to talk about is this idea of indexing. So one of the ways we think about an array is being an ordered list. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the data inside it has an order. For example, in this case, I've just kind of thrown names in. People aren't ordered alphabetically or in any other way. But if we did have ordered data, arrays would be really great for that too. What I mean by arrays being ordered is that the way that we look up or access items in an array is always based on order. So I'm going to go ahead and put these all on separate lines to make this next point really clear. As far as syntax goes, both, both ways of declaring arrays are totally valid. Sometimes you'll see all the different items in it on a single line. Sometimes you'll see it all on one line. Uh, that's going to depend on the code base and the code style. So anyways, let me add some indices in here. So with for loops, you got a little bit of a first taste of something called zero indexing, which is a standard in computer science. All that means is that we always start counting at zero. Same thing is true in an array. You think of the first item in the array, in this case, Sue, as being item number zero. The next item in the array is item number one. The next one's item number two and item number three. So don't worry, if you're a little confused by this, you're not alone. This is one of the most common mistakes that beginner programmers make, is thinking that the first item is going to be index one. It's actually index zero. All I can say on this matter is that you'll probably forget a couple times and get weird errors and get frustrated, but pretty soon you'll get used to the zero indexing and it'll become second nature. And all your friends will be wondering why you're counting starting at zero. So that's zero indexing for you. So we would say that the student's array has four items in it, as you would think, one, two, three, four, but you would still say that this is the zeroth item or the item in slot one, the item in slot two, even though it's actually the third item, it's in index two. So we use these indices to look up items in our array. So let's say that I wanted to know what the first student in the student's array is. This is the syntax for looking up items in an array. We use the hard brackets, the same brackets we use to declare them, and then whatever index you want. So in this case, students at zero will give us Sue. If I wanted Toby, I would have to do students at three. And notice that if I use an index, um, that's larger than the amount of numbers in the array, I'm going to get undefined because there's nothing at index five right now. So that is how we look up items in an array. And it's really useful because oftentimes with arrays, you do actually have ordered data. So let's say instead of students, I had a to-do list. So my to-do list for today is teach lesson six, go for a walk, cook dinner. You guys are learning what a thrilling life I live outside of Lambda School. Uh, clean kitchen. There we go. So this is my to-do list. So this is actually ordered. I need to do teach Lambda School first, then I need to go for a walk while it's still light, then cook dinner, and then clean the kitchen. So. Now it's really easy to use, or it's really intuitive and useful to use that indexing because I might say, hey, what's next on my to-do list? What's the very first thing I need to do? And I know that whatever it is, it's going to be at index zero. 
And then I can say, oh, hey, next on my to-do list is teach lesson six. Good thing that I am already teaching it right now. So then I can say, well, what's, what am I going to do after? And I go up to one, and I can see go for a walk. So while the data inside of an array doesn't need to be ordered, arrays work really well for ordered data. So let me show you a couple other things you can do with this bracket notation. You can use it for lookup, but you can also use it for assignment or reassignment. So as we see, there are four items in the array right now, um, which means that we have index zero through three. Let's say I wanted to add something at index four. So after cleaning the kitchen, maybe I want to read a book. Now, if I go ahead and check my to-do array, I can see that that read a book item has been added into the list. So we can use this index to assign new items on. We can also use it to reassign. Let's say that I do want to read a book, but honestly, I'm not feeling up to cleaning the kitchen tonight. Instead of adding it to the end, I could reassign it at index three, and now it's been overwritten. So we can use, um, so we can use this um, bracket notation to look things up, to add new items, or to overwrite existing items. So I see a question in Slack that I really like, and it's something I was actually going to mention shortly, so I'll mention it now, which is this idea of does everything inside of an array need to be the same data type? As we see, everything in here is a string. So from a JavaScript syntax viewpoint, no, there's no need to have everything in array be the same. So I could create a random stuff array, and I could throw in a Boolean, a string. I could even throw in another array. I could throw in a number. And this thing is totally valid. I'm not going to get an error. However, I would say be careful when you're doing this. In the vast majority of cases, it's going to work best to create an array where all the items in it are of the same type. So while this is syntactically allowed and admittedly in some cases extremely useful to be able to combine types like this, as a starter coder, I would say try to stick to creating like type items inside of an array. We'll see a little later in the lesson objects, which are a much better data structure for when you have a bunch of different types of data all together. So yes, it is allowed, but just be careful because it can create complications if you're not paying close attention. So that's the answer to that question. All right, so um, there's one more question in Slack that I'm actually gonna answer now too, because I think it's a really good question, which is this idea of can an array contain a variable? So this actually brings up a bigger question, which is what is a variable? So if I create a variable, let's say um, to do item, and then I am going to set that equal to, um, let's say, Rearrange furniture. So this is the variable name, and there's we've definitely created a variable, which means something stored in memory, but the type isn't variable. So variable isn't a data type in JavaScript. The type of this variable is a string. So of anything that can be stored inside of a variable can also be stored in an array. And you can certainly do to do at, let's do to do at four, and set it equal to do, to do item. So you can use a variable name to store something into an array. That's definitely allowed. But keep in mind that this to do item is actually just a string. So from the code's perspective, this bit of code is exactly the same as just actually storing the string or putting the string directly in. So you can, whenever you, whenever you have, say, a variable that's set equal to a string, you can do anything with this variable name that you could do with a string normally. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of info about arrays and also gave you a little bit of extra info about how to think about variables in general. All right, so let me talk um, a little bit more about some useful things we can do with arrays. So throughout this JavaScript section,
we've been talking all about methods and properties and you've seen some you've seen the length property on strings you've seen hopefully at this point a few string methods some math methods and it turns out that there are properties and methods on arrays as well and actually a lot of overlap with strings so if we do to do dot length as you might imagine this works really similar to string dot length so this will give us length 4 once again Keep in mind that length is it's exactly what you'd expect it to be. There are four items in the array, so the length is four. But what can get confusing is that there's nothing at index four. So this is something I see all the time, which is you might say index equals to do.length, and you think, okay, this is going to be the last item in the array, right? And then if you try to look up to do at index, you get undefined. And that's because of zero indexing. You always have to do index um, minus one if you want the last item because everything is offset by one. If there are four items in the array, that means that the last item is at index three. If there are 17 items in the array, that means the last item is at index 16. Once again, definitely confusing at first. It just takes a little practice and you'll get used to it. So, okay. Um, let me show you a few array methods and then yeah let's do that so one of the most useful ones is something called push so i showed you how to add an item on the end so we could do to do at four and that totally works but let's say that we don't know how many items are in to do we want to add something to the end but we're not quite sure how many items are in there so instead, we could use the push method. So because we're using a method now, we actually have to put in that string as an argument. So let me do that. Let me show you that it worked. So sure enough, read a book has been attached to the end. And if I pushed another item, It would go on the end. So push doesn't care about index. It's just going to put whatever the argument is on the end. So, and this is a perfect opportunity to review a little bit of what we talked about last night with um, with functions. So push is a method, which, as we learned last night, is a type of function. So methods are attached onto some sort of other variable with this dot notation. In this case, push is something. It only exists on an array. So as long as this variable on this side of the dot is an array, you can use the push method. So what push does is it takes in one argument, it can be any data type, and it sticks it on the end. And push, as it were, has no output. There's no return value. And we can confirm that by running it, and we see, oh, actually, just kidding, I misspoke. Push does have a return value. It tells us what index, or it looks like it tells us the length of the array. I had totally forgotten that push had an output. I'm sorry for misspeaking there. So that's cool. Push's output appears to be the length of the array with the new item added on. So let me double check that. And yep, so that one gives us five. All right, cool. So that is push for you. Now let's do pop. Pop is kind of like push's evil twin. So if instead we want to pop something off the end, if we're like, dang, I'm way too busy today, let's remove whatever is on the end of my to-do list, let's just get rid of it. So in that case, we would use the pop method. Once again, this is an array method, which means we can use it on any array. So if we do to-do.pop, the return value will be the last item. So when we run this, we see that we've popped off the last item, clean kitchen. But beyond that, if we look in the array, we can see that it's now missing. So pop pops off the last item and returns it. And then in the future, if we look inside of our array, we see that it is missing. So that is the pop method. We can see that there is no argument that we need to put inside of pop. It just pops off the last item. So those are just two array methods for you. There are a bunch others. I just have over here in a W3 schools, a giant list of them. So we can see that there are a bunch. We will learn a few more of these on our last night of this course.
you're welcome to look at this documentation. I'll actually throw this in Slack for you guys. If you want to check it out, feel free. Um, some other fun ones are there's Slice, which is similar to strings. You can slice off part of an array. Um, I really like Reverse. That one's fun. So if you want to just reverse the order of the array, you call Reverse. Um, you can also do, there's something called Shift Unshift, which is kind of like Push Pop, but for the first item in the array. So feel free to play around with those if you want. But just knowing Push Pop is a good place to start. So yeah, we have um, array methods and properties. So we can see that arrays are really useful tools for a few different reasons. One is that um, we don't want to repeat ourselves, right? So that first example I showed you where we create a new variable for each array item is really repetitive. Second of all, we want to structure our data, data so that from the code's perspective, it's related. And by putting it in a data structure like an array, we're signifying on a code level that these things go together. The next reason we like data structures is because there's interesting built-in functionality. We can use indexing, we can use the length property, and we can use all the array methods. So all this logic that we might want to execute with connected data like this, it might turn out that whatever we want to do is already built into JavaScript, or at least there's built-in tools to help us build whatever functionality we need. So arrays are great. Whenever you have related data, at least if they're data of this form, where they're, um, whenever you have related data, you want to put it in a data structure. An array might not always be the perfect data structure, but I'll show you objects in a minute, which are pretty versatile. The very last thing I want to mention before we move on to objects is something that I saw come up in the Slack channel that I think is another great question. So I want to mention it as well. So, um, so that is this uh, question of, wait, if this is const, how are we altering it? How are we allowed to do to do.pop and remove an item if this is supposed to be a constant? So, it's a little bit confusing. It's kind of like if you think about an array as being a house, um, you could change what's inside of the house, right? You know, you could get rid of furniture, add furniture, rearrange the furniture, but the house is still the same. Um, but if you moved, that would be a totally different house. So you couldn't do to do and reassign it to a whole new array. If you did that, that would be completely overwriting the structure here. So if we do that, we get a syntax error. And of course, if we try to assign this to just something totally different, like a number, we'll still get a syntax error. But arrays are designed so that we can alter the contents of it freely. So even though it's a constant in the sense that we have one fixed array, we can change what's inside of that array at will without violating the constant constraint. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's move on to objects. Objects are another data structure. They're definitely related to arrays, but a bit more versatile. So let me show you a what not to do example to lead into objects. Um, all right, so I am going to, let's say that instead of creating a roster for the class, I wanted to create some information for one specific student. So name, let's say location, um, he's in uh, Pucklock, Tennessee, and we can say um, age, I don't know why we would need to know his hometown, but let's say we want to know hometown. He is from um, Anchorage, Alaska. Is Alaska, what is the abbreviation of Alaska? I don't know that, <laughs> we'll just spell it out. <laughs> well, that's embarrassing. I feel like this, the like side thing that you get to learn, and apart from learning to code in this course, you also get to learn all the random things I don't know how to spell, or all the vegetables that I don't know if they're actually fruits or vegetables, AK, okay. I was worried that was Arkansas, but perfect. That's good to know. 
now I won't offend all the many Alaskans that I encounter in my day to day life. OK, so we have um, so we have some information about Simon. So as we can see, we're in a similar scenario where. Um, oh, and let's do one more. So knows JavaScript false. So we're in a similar scenario in that clearly all these pieces of data are related in some way, right? They're all related to this Simon character. Um, however, it's a little different than the array. It's, there's not quite as much of a pattern here. And furthermore, we can definitely see that we have different data types going on here. A few different strings, but we also have an age and a Boolean. So if we wanted to, we could create an array called Simon Info and start to throw everything in here. Um, then his name, his current location, his hometown, his, yep, I'm putting in a slightly different order, but that's fine. So this is syntactically a totally valid array. And it's not the worst piece of code in the world, but it's a little confusing, right? You know, we could maybe figure out, okay, that's a name, this might be an age. These are two towns, but just from looking at this piece of code alone, we have no idea what these towns refer to and why there are two of them. And we certainly have no idea what that Boolean value refers to. So once again, if I'm writing this out and explaining it to you verbally, it's clear what this array refers to. If you can see this above here, then OK, it makes sense. But we wouldn't want this bit of code. So on its own, this really doesn't have much useful info in it. It's pretty confusing. We would have to probably comment it out in order to make sense of it. And that's not the best. So in this case, rather than using an array, we would want to use an object. So the biggest difference between an array and an object is that objects have labeling built into them. So they work really well for these kind of related but slightly different bits of data because we can label what each one refers to. So let's go ahead and do a fabulous makeover on our array and turn it into an object. So for starters, we want different types of brackets. So for objects, we use our curly brackets. And it's really important that we use the right kind of brackets if we're doing arrays versus objects, because that's our way of telling the code or telling the computer, hey, now we're creating an object versus now we're creating an array. So I'm getting some replets getting angry at me because right now I have array syntax inside of an object declaration. So let's fix that. So for starter, let's put some labels in. Oh, his last name in. Uh, that was current location, this one is hometown, and then we have age, and finally, knows JavaScript. So voila, we have a fully functional object. So let's break this down to make sure that the syntax is clear. As per usual, our variable declaration looks familiar. Just like with an array, we'll use the constant keyword, but we'll still be able to manipulate the items inside of this. So we can alter the data inside without violating the constant. We can't totally overwrite this, but, um, and I'm just gonna call this student info. Okay, so inside, instead of just having data points, we have pairs, key value pairs. So over here we have our key, which is our label, and notice that we, we can put this in quotes if we want. And for all intents and purposes, we could think of this as being a string. Um, you can't label it with a number or symbols. Like you couldn't do exclamation point over here. That wouldn't work. So that should be just text. Uh, but you don't have to put it in a quote. So we have name, a colon, and then we have whatever our data point is followed by a comma. And then the next entry, we have our label. Once again, that's our key, colon, our value, another string. And we see that it goes on and on. Notice that I've, I have this comma at the end. That is optional. I like to put it on because then if I want to add another pair in here, I can just start writing 
It's easy to forget it if you leave it off, but that is optional. So um, I do want to bring up, I'm glad that we talked about this idea of different types of data. So as mentioned with arrays, we're allowed to have different types of data, but you want to be careful because in my experience, if you're trying to group different values that are different types, usually an object is better. Usually that means that it's the kind of collection that you would want labeled. So more often, if you're dealing with different types of data, you're going to have an object. And in, that, in this case, it's totally normal to see an object that contains all sorts of different data types. It's very much built into what objects are designed to do. So now we have all this info about Simon. And just by the structure of this object alone, it's pretty clear to see what all these bits of information mean. OK. So let me talk about things like lookup. So as with an object, we want to be able to do things like look up items, add new items, overwrite items. And of course, if we want, just like with that, um, just like with the array, we could always start with an empty object and just fill it later in the code. But we're also totally welcome to put our items directly in in the same line that we declare it. So let's start with adding a new pair. So let's say. Um, we want to add something about gender in here. So we could do student info dot gender, and then we can do male. So now if we look inside of our objects, we can see that this gender has been added. So let's look at this notation. This is called dot notation. And notice that it's very similar to what we've seen with properties. And in fact, you could we call these keys, but you could refer to any of these inside the object as properties. So we're used to seeing properties as something that's built in, like the array.length. But within objects, uh, properties are things that we actually write ourselves. So we've created a name property, a current location property, a hometown property, et cetera. Down here, we just use dot notation to add a gender property. In that same dot notation form, we can also overwrite something. So once Simon is done with the course, we definitely want to overwrite nose.js as being true. So whenever I refer to a property name that already exists, and then I assign it to something, it's just overwriting. If the property name doesn't exist yet, then it creates a new one. If it already exists, it overwrites it. So if we ever want to fully delete a property, there are a couple ways to do it. We could always set it equal to null. But if we want to remove it altogether, oops, I spelled that different. There we go. So if we want to delete it altogether, there is a keyword called delete. So what you do is you just type the word delete, followed by the object and the property of, in question, and that will remove it all together from the object. So those are kind of the three main things you do with objects. You would add a new key value pair, update one, or delete one. And the standard way to do that is dot notation. But notice that using dot notation, we need to explicitly know what the name of the key that we're dealing with is. We actually type out the name of the key. But sometimes we might not know the key name. We might be dealing with a variable. And of course, in this example, we can see that key is equal to the string name. But sometime this variable might be coming from somewhere else, from a user input or from a different file. It might be changing. So if we did student info dot key, hold on. If we look up student info dot key, we get undefined. And that's because it's looking for something explicitly called key on here. There's nothing on, there's no key name called key. You know, we could create one, but it doesn't exist right now. So instead, we would use bracket notation in this case. So if we're ever trying to look up something or delete something or overwrite something in an object, and instead of knowing the actual explicit name, we have a variable that contains a string with the name, we use bracket notation. So it's true that objects also use bracket notation, but in a slightly different way than um, arrays. So in arrays, we can either put in 
you know, we can exp if this were an array, we could explicitly put in the number or put in a variable equal to a number. But with, and it's true that with, um, let me put that back. It is true that with objects, if we wanted to, we could drop a string straight in here and that would work too. But generally speaking, if we're using bracket notation, it's because we're using a variable to refer to the key. If we know literally what the key name is, dot notation is the way to go. So practice using both. They're both useful in different situations. All right, so I wanted to talk about object methods next. So we saw that in the case of objects, properties aren't really things that are built in. They're things that we write ourselves. The same is true about methods. So let's say that we wanted a method called say hi. Now, as we know, methods are function. Oops, student info. Methods are just functions. So as we learned last night, we are welcome, to, if we can spell function correctly, we are welcome to write our own functions. So let's create the say hi function that just console logs hello. So I've now written a method onto the student info object. So let's break this down. I use dot notation to, as with any other property, use dot notation to assign the name of the new key. And then the only thing that makes it, that differentiates a method versus a property is that instead of setting it equal to a string or a Boolean or something else, you would set it equal to a anonymous function. So this is very similar to that syntax we saw last night of assigning a, or of creating a function and saving it into a variable. In this case, we're just creating a function and saving it into a key on an object. And then as usual, we write all of our function logic within the curly brackets. So now I have created a say hi function. So if I do student info dot say hi, remember if I leave off the parentheses, this is just a function. It tells me that's a function. But if I want to execute it, I call it. And as we see, there are no arguments necessary. So I can run say hi, and it says hello. But let's make this a little more interesting. So we can also work with some of the other items inside this array. So instead, we could go, hello, I am. And then I'm going to tack on student info dot name. So now when I run say hi, he actually introduces himself. So that is kind of a cool, more dynamic way to use methods because, um, because a lot of the times these methods we're adding to objects actually utilize some of the info within the object itself. So we can just explicitly call dot name on our student info object. And in this way, even if we update student info dot name equals now, our say hi method updates dynamically. So whatever name is equal to, that will be logged within this. If we had explicitly written out Simon's name, then we'd be in trouble because name might change. But yeah, so this is a really cool way to write a method onto an object. I wanna show you one more thing we can do here. So instead of writing out student info, we could also use this a keyword called this. And this is just referring to whatever object we're working in. So I can explicitly write out the name of the object, or I can use the keyword this. In this example, both ways work fine. But as we're going to see tomorrow, the keyword this sometimes becomes really important. So I wanted to just introduce it to you tonight. So this is an object method. Once again, when we're dealing with objects, methods are no longer things that are actually built in but there are functions that we're writing ourselves. One thing, one last thing I wanted to just clarify with these methods is that in this case, I'm tacking on the method after the fact, but we can also add methods in the declaration itself. So I could go ahead and add another key value pair and just use the colon as usual, set it equal to the anonymous function. And now that method has been built in in the declaration. So methods, properties,
they both can be added in when we declare our object or they can be added in after the fact using dot notation. So let's confirm that this thing works all right. Call say hi. Looks like it's working. So that is an object method. All right, the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is looping. So I'm gonna actually pause on the objects for just a second and talk about array looping as well because I want to, um, I want to do a little for loop recap here. So I'm gonna create another array up here, just a really simple one. It contains some random numbers. So if we want to loop through our numbers array, for loops are really useful. Actually, sorry, let me rearrange this code so we know what we're working with. Okay. Here we go. So if we want to loop through numbers, we could use our familiar friend, the for loop. So I can write this array for loop pretty much in my sleep because I've written it so many times. But let me break down what happens here. Well, I'll run it first. Oops, to spell it correctly, always a problem. There we go. So we, when we're looping through an array with a for loop, we always start i at zero because we use zero indexing. And then our continue condition is always less than length. So this is one area where this weird offset index, indexing works really well. Because as long as i is less than length, we're good. Because even though this has four items, the last index is three. So that would be our next line, and then we just increment i. So then whichever number we're on is going to be numbers at index i. And in this case, I've just console logged it. So we can see that we managed to log all of our items. So if you ever want to use a for loop to loop through an array, it works really well. It's basically going to look like this every single time, unless you wanted to skip items. I will say that a for loop is not the preferred way to loop through an array. There is a built-in loop called for each, but we will not get to that until Thursday night. So for now, stick with for loops. If you really want to, you can look into for each loops, but they're a little more complicated, and so we're going to use the entire night actually on Thursday to talk about something called callback functions, which are pretty critical to using a for each loop. So we will get to for each loops, but just know that for loops and arrays work really well. On that note, you might be wondering how to loop through an object. As it were, for loops are not the way to go when you loop through an object. Uh, it should be pretty obvious um, why that won't work, just thinking about the way we look up things in objects. So if we tried to loop through, um, even if we knew how many items were in here, which we don't really have a clear way of doing that right now because there's no length property. Um, so if we looped through, first of all, we wouldn't have a length property. And second of all, loops give us numbers and we don't look up things in an object by number. We look, it up, we look things up based on these key names. Luckily, objects have their own loops. They're called for in loops. So let me do the syntax for that. And as it were, for in loops are actually even simpler to write. So here's the syntax. We do the for keyword, and then in our parentheses, we do let key in student info. So let, of course, is a keyword um, for the variable declaration, and then we declare a key. So this variable, is kind of like I in the for loop. By convention, we set it equal to key, but it could be anything. I'm going to stick with key. Then we use the in keyword and follow it by the name of the object. So this is a variable. It can be anything, but key is preferred. This will be the object we want to loop through. And then if we console log key, we'll see that it gives us every single key inside of our object. So we have the key names. So if instead of the keys, we want the values, we can use bracket notation. As a little reminder, bracket notation would be the way to go here because we don't explicitly know the name of the keys, but we have a variable 
that's going to be equal to them. So we can do student info using bracket notation at key. And in this way, we are able to see everything. So we have our name and then the value, our current location, value, hometown, et cetera, and even the method. So we have the name say hi, and we actually print out the entire contents of that function for value. So that's really nice. That is how we loop through objects with a for in loop. So for loops, great for arrays, at least until you learn for each. For in loops, great for objects. And that's how you loop through them. The very last thing, uh, the very last thing that I want to cover it's a little bit tangentially related is something called the arguments. So last night I very briefly mentioned arguments and then I said, let's not look at that yet. You need to know what objects are. So let me just bring that up again now that we have all the pieces of the puzzle together. So if I create a function called this function and let's say this thing just returns same string every single time. So not a very interesting function, right? No arguments, it just returns the same string every time. But as you might have noticed, even though the function declaration doesn't call for any arguments, we the user could put in anything we wanted. We could do true, we could do um, the word shovel, we could do the number 17, whatever we wanted to. And right now that wouldn't Luckily, that won't mess up the code. Even though we're throwing in random items in our test function, this will still run. But sometimes when we're writing a function, we actually want to know what the user is putting in. And sometimes we don't even need to or want to know in advance how many items are in here. So I could write out arg1, arg2, arg3, but what if the user put in four or five or seven? That's when you would use the keyword arguments. So there is inside the function scope a word called arguments that you can access. And let's go ahead and console log that to see what it is. We can now recognize this as an object. So we know it's an object because it has the curly brackets. Notice that it's kind of like an array though. Um, so we actually refer to the arguments confusingly enough as an array-like object. That's because we're using these number-based indexing. So the key is zero, the value is true. Key one, value shovel, etc. So arguments is a little weird in that we can use some bracket notation that looks an awful lot like we're working with an array, but it's actually technically an object. So arguments is a little bit, oops, once again, have to spell it right. It's kind of a freakish little object because it is technically an object, but it kind of works like an array. However, if I tried to do an array method on it, that wouldn't work because it's not really an array. So kind of an odd topic, it doesn't really fit into anything, but it's a really useful thing to know how to work with when writing functions. And it's also a nice little example of an, of an object and an object that's kind of like an array. So I thought I'd just bring it up and mention it and come full circle because I mentioned it last night. So that is pretty much everything I have. That is pretty much everything I have for you guys in terms of objects and arrays. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor to questions. Um, and then actually, sorry, First, I want to go over a couple things for the homework tonight, then we will do questions. So be patient just a moment longer. So for tonight, um, the homework's gonna look fairly similar to last night. It's just a bunch of functions that you guys have to write, just a bunch of empty functions that you have to write. The difference here is that those functions all involve arrays and objects in one way or another. I do wanna mention, uh, there was something I brought up last night, about this idea of mocking out HTML. And you're gonna do something similar tonight with CSS. So let me go over that really quickly because this is something I really want you guys to conceptually understand. So let's say I created an object called CSS properties. And I had maybe color, blue, oops. And then let's say, background color black, 
margin, 30 pixels, et cetera. So this once again begs the question of what are we dealing with? Is this JavaScript or CSS? So this is JavaScript code. The first way we can tell it's JavaScript code is because we are in a JavaScript REPL right now. So there's really, we're really only allowed to write JavaScript code right now. Second of all, we can tell it's JavaScript code because it's valid JavaScript syntax. You know, we've declared our variable, we've uh, used curly brackets to indicate we're dealing with an object, we have three key value pairs, we have strings as our values. This is all valid JavaScript. So this is a JavaScript object. Of course, it refers to something related to CSS and it's representing CSS. And once we got more advanced into uh, web development, we might use something like this to actually manipulate our CSS. But for now, for what you're doing in the homework, you'll just be creating a JavaScript object that contains key value pairs that represent CSS properties. So once again, it's JavaScript code but it's representing CSS. So hopefully that's clear. And don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. It's just JavaScript. So that was all I wanted to mention for the homework tonight. I'm now ready for questions. I'll try and answer um, any of them that are floating already in Slack and feel free to ask any more. OK, so Sebastian asked, um, in terms of arrays, what is the difference between a for loop and a for in loop? That's actually a really good question. So let me go ahead and create another array. And I'll make that a little more interesting. So here is a pretty simple array. At index zero, we have first, index two, or index one, second, <laughs> index two, third. So as I showed you, right now, the best way to loop through this thing is probably going to be a for loop. So a for loop, from a pure syntax standpoint, we know it's a for loop because Inside of the parentheses, we have three conditions. We start by declaring uh, our index, and then we separate it with a semicolon. Next, we have a continue condition, semicolon, and then finally, we have some sort of way of incrementing or decrementing our index value. So syntactically, that's how we know we're dealing with a for loop. We've looped through our numbers, and so of course, we are welcome to look up all the items in our array using those indices. So I have just looped through an array with a for loop. But are we, could we do that using a for in loop? So this is dangerous territory because I'm going to show you guys how to do something that I don't actually want you to do, which is, so for let i in array. So this is a for in loop. I'm using i, which we're used to seeing in, an, in a for loop, but keep in mind that's just a variable, so I can call it whatever I want. We know syntactically this is a for in loop because instead of having those three conditions, like a for loop, we just have one thing in here, which is a variable declaration followed by the keyword in, followed by our object. And in this case, I'm actually using an array instead of an object. And as to why this doesn't throw an error, we'll address that a little more tomorrow. But I will say that you are allowed to put an array inside of a for in loop, even though it's designed for objects. So what happens when I log i? Well, it seems to work fine. So this is dangerous territory because here's why. So most of the time, a for in loop will actually work with an array, but not always. There are some edge cases where this will create some complications. So let's say that I did something kind of weird, which is I defined array at six as um, that would be seventh. So this is a weird situation, right? Because there's some missing items in here. But we would think of this thing as 
let me comment actually both loops out. We would think of this thing as having seven items in it. So if I console log array.length, I get seven items. You would think of it as being there are three empty items. So you think of it maybe as being first, second, third, um, undefined, 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 seventh. But you want to think of this array as having seven items in it. However, if I do a for loop, it's going to act as if those indices are missing. And that's not really what we want. So this is one weird edge case where using a for in loop on an array might create confusion. That's one reason why you should just stick with a for, a regular for loop or a for each loop. So notice that here we now have those three undefined that are being logged. So that's that might have been a little long-winded way to answer your question. Hopefully that showed you guys, first of all, syntactically how you can tell, am I using a for loop or a for in loop? And second, it kind of addressed this question of, can you use a for in loop with an array, which is that yes, you can, but you probably don't want to. All right, um, I see one question in there about, uh, it says, I do not follow why we need to use bracket notation. I'm not sure if you are referring to an array or an object in that question, but I will answer that question for both because I think brackets are pretty important. So let's start with just an array. So with an array, you have to use bracket notation. It is literally the only way to look an item up. So if you want to look an item up by index, you use bracket notation. That's just how it's done. So that answers the question of why do you use bracket notation with arrays? But let's answer it for objects instead. This is going to be a very boring object. OK. So here we have a really simple object with two key value pairs. So we don't need, we don't always need bracket notation with objects. We can use dot notation, for example, to look up key one or key two. But let's say that we had some variable coming to us from some outside source. So I can't really fully mock this out in, um, in REPL it because I, of course, just wrote the mystery variable. But it's entirely possible that the mystery variable were being passed to us from some other code base or some other file or even a user input. So I know I have a variable that refers to a key name, but I don't know what this contains. So in this case, if I actually tried to use dot notation, I would get undefined because it's looking for a key that is literally named mystery bar. However, if I want to look up something in the object based on the string that's stored in this, that is when I use bracket notation. So bracket notation is not always necessary in the case of an object, but it becomes necessary when we have a variable name and we're not quite sure what it refers to. A for in loop is a great example of this because if I do for let key in object, each time this runs, key will be set to something different. So if I did object.key, I wouldn't get anything because there's nothing called key, but key will be equal to the strings that are the names of the, of the keys. So I have to use bracket notation in this case because I'm not interested in a property called key, I'm interested in a property with called whatever string key actually refers to. And this really ties into that thing that I mentioned earlier about keep in mind that a variable name is just a variable name. It's just a tool we use to look up what is actually stored inside of it. So key is just a name that points to an actual JavaScript piece of data. In this case, it's going to be pointing to a string, first this string, and then the second time we go through the loop, this string. So hopefully that clarifies when and why we use bracket notation, both for arrays and objects. And I see someone else asking about the syntax of a for in loop. And since I have one on screen, I will break it down one more time. So we use the keyword for, just like with a regular for loop, 
followed by that we use parentheses. And inside of this, we need four words. The keyword let, a variable name, by default just use key, in, which is another keyword, and then the name of the object. So really you can just get in the habit of always writing let key in. You can always use that if you want. And then the only thing you have to swap out is the name of the object. So if I change this to, if I actually spelled out, well, I can't spell it object because object of things, this will no longer work, right? Because object is not defined anymore. If we run it, it says object is not defined. So this last word always refers to the name of an object. And then within our loop scope, we can do whatever we want using this key. The key will change every time. So the first time we loop through this, first iteration, key is equal to the string key one. The second iteration, key will be equal to key two. If there were more key value pairs in here, we might have a third, fourth, fifth, hundredth iteration, but however many pairs there are in our object, that's how many times we will iterate through with the value of key changing every time. So then if we want to do something with the key, we're welcome to use that key variable, or we can use it to look up the value on the object. So that's a little bit more of a detailed deep dive into what's going on in this for in loop. It looks like Slack has gotten pretty quiet. So I think that we might be done with questions for tonight. I'll give it just a second to see if anyone else has anything that they want to ask. All right, I see someone typing, so let's hang tight for a minute. I feel like I should have some like mini stand-up routine prepared for these moments where we're waiting for people to type on Slack <laughs> instead of just awkwardly sitting here. Okay, um, yeah, we have a great question. So um, it looks like DA asked, inside of object of things, why do the key have quotes around them? Um, no good reason. So if we want to, we can put quotes around the keys. It's totally extra. Um, it's not necessary. It's the style of how an object is declared will probably depend on the code base you're working in. I usually stick with just writing them out because it's a couple less characters, but for whatever reason, I just added quotes this time. I don't know why. So either way works, both are valid syntax. Cool, uh, and a question about functions actually. So Ed Vardis asked, can I assign a function to a variable? That is a little outside of the scope of tonight's topic, but very relevant to some of the things that we saw last night and some of the things we'll see later this week. So I want to address it, which is, so yes, in JavaScript, the functions work like just about any other variable. So we can declare a function with either let or const. So I've gone ahead and created this anonymous function and saved it in here. And the function works just fine. I can also pass around functions at will. So if I created a new function, I could pass it in there, no problem. I could also, if I created an object, I could do object.method equals new function, I can use this variable name to store it into method. So now I have, I know I'm kind of going wild over here, but we really just have one function over here, but we've stored it in three places, in this variable, in this other variable, and inside of this method. So we can pass around functions at will. 
A couple crazy things we can also do with functions is we can pass them into other functions, which we'll see on Thursday, and we can return them out of functions. So anything you can do with a variable, you can do with a function. Um, one, sorry, going back to this object example of with key one and key two, we have a question about matching syntax. So um, if we did key one value and then key two, that is allowed. It looks kind of hacky. I wouldn't do this intentionally. Um, and I mean, first of all, once you're on a team, you'll have an actual code style guide. So they will specify, like once you are working with a company and on a project, they'll have a style guide, which will probably tell you things like, should keys be in quotes or not? But even if you don't have a style guide, this looks pretty hacky and inconsistent. So um, says, says the woman who's always switching around syntax and switching up if I'm using single and double quotes. So I'm kind of an example of what not to do sometimes. I apologize for that. But I would keep it consistent. So either keep them both in quotes or neither. But it's not a syntax issue. Um, from a syntax perspective, this is valid. And object was defined with no problem. All right, any last questions before I set you loose? Okay, it seems pretty quiet, and I think I'm going to call it here because I want to make sure you have plenty of time for homework. As is almost always the case with code, it's pretty hard for it to fully make sense until you kind of get in the weeds. Well, thank you guys for sticking with me tonight and learning a bit about func or not functions. Functions was last night. Uh, today we talked about data structures. So we learned all about arrays and objects extremely powerful tools. Um, the two, they're really the two built-in data structures in JavaScript. And between the two of them, you're, the world of what you can do just expands so much. So all the time in programming, you're working with these different variables that are related in some ways. And being able to group them together, either in a list form with an array or in kind of a labeled key pair form with an object, it just opens up a world of what you can do with JavaScript. So you'll get a little bit of experience with that tonight. We have a bunch of assignments for you that will allow you to practice with both of them. So good luck with that. As per usual, your project managers will send you the link for that and you can go ahead and start working on it. That is all for tonight. And tomorrow we are doing classes. Tomorrow is actually one of my favorite topics, so I'm really excited. So essentially tomorrow we're gonna learn how to create an entirely new data type in JavaScript and it will utilize a lot of the things that we've been learning already and kind of tie it together. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Good luck with the homework, and make sure you're reaching out on Slack if you have any questions. So, all right, good luck, guys. <laughs>